Welcome to today's community lecture. I'm your host, Dr. Nav Badesha. I'm a current UCLA Geriatrics Fellow. Today we'll be discussing not just how to prevent muscle loss, but how regaining muscle mass is possible at any age, as well as the specific evidence-based protocols that can assist in successful aging. By the end of today's lecture, you'll be able to define sarcopenia and identify its causes. You will be able to understand the risks associated with sarcopenia and the treatment. And lastly, we'll also be learning about how different exercises cause different changes in your body. Let's start with a question. True or false? All healthy human adults begin to lose muscle after the age of 30. The answer is true. Healthy human beings begin to lose muscle mass after the age of 30. Let's take a look at some pictures. Here are examples of thigh muscles. What we're seeing here are axial MRI views of the thighs. Imagine cutting into the thigh in half and looking at it in a cross section. This picture here shows the muscle loss of the thigh between the ages of 35, 55, and 85. The white in the middle is the femur. The red is the quad and hamstrings. And the white is subcutaneous fat. There is less muscle, less bone density, and more fat in the images of the older adults. Question number two, true or false? It is possible to put on muscle mass after the age of 80. The answer is true. Here's an excellent reminder of the power of exercise in preserving muscle mass as we age. At the top, we have a 74-year-old gentleman who spends most of his time sitting or laying in bed. And at the bottom, we have the image of a 70-year-old who is a triathlete. He still runs, he still lifts weights, and he still stretches. Notice how much more muscle tissue the 70 year old active gentleman has when compared to the 74 year old who is not very active. Our muscles play a major role in our body from allowing us to move, maintain our posture, and stabilizing our joints. But starting as early as the age of 30, we all gradually lose muscle mass and strength. Some of us lose it more quickly because of a serious condition called sarcopenia, which becomes more common with age. It can lead to disability, loss of independence, more frequent hospitalizations, the need for long-term care, and even death. What causes sarcopenia? It's still unclear, but we believe it's related to lifestyle factors such as a lack of physical activity, poor calorie and protein intake, a decline in anabolic hormones, an increase in inflammatory markers, changes in the connection of the brain and the muscle, and a decline in blood flow to muscle with aging. How serious is sarcopenia? Besides making you weaker, it can also impact balance and the ability to walk. It can weaken the bones and make you frail. 
It's known to increase fatigue, raise risk of disease, worsen existing conditions, cause weight gain, and raise the risk of malnutrition. These can lead to difficulties getting around, trouble performing normal daily activities, falls and bone fractures, increased disabilities, diminished quality of life, loss of independence, and more and longer hospital stays, higher risk of post-surgical complications, and lower rates of survival and eventual need for long-term care. It's also an expensive condition, increasing individual health care costs by more than $2,300 a year for every person who has sarcopenia. This doesn't begin to include the costs that come with loss of independence, increased illness, and difficulty with everyday functioning. How do you know if you have sarcopenia? If you're over the age of 65 and you feel as though you require rest due to lack of strength, or if your walking speed has slowed, or if you've had difficulty rising from a chair or climbing stairs, or if you've had a fall, there are tests that your doctors can do to assess for it. These include a balance test, walking speed, chair stands, and assessing grip strength. Now that we understand sarcopenia and what it is, let's go ahead and discuss how we can treat this and potentially reverse it. As we discussed earlier, we can prevent sarcopenia and even gain muscle at any age. There's a number of potential treatments under development that could interfere with the cellular changes that lead to sarcopenia. There are also treatments that can help with potential underlying causes of sarcopenia like malnutrition, cancer, and GI disorders. Scientists have found that exercise and nutritional interventions that deliver healthy diets or nutritional supplements with key nutrients for muscle health can slow the decline from sarcopenia, improve physical performance, and even prevent future loss. Let's discuss the specific types of exercises that are recommended in treating and preventing sarcopenia. Number one, strength training or resistance training, which can be looked at as lifting weights or using resistance bands is considered the most effective exercise for preventing and treating sarcopenia. There is a way to find out if your legs are weak or if you have some component of sarcopenia. Do you use your hands to stand up and could you stand up without using your hands? If you do use your hands to stand up and you would find it difficult to stand without using them, it is likely that you do have leg weakness and possibly some component of sarcopenia. One of the best ways to treat this is by doing this exercise called chair stands. These chair stands are scientifically proven to help prevent falls. Here's an example of a chair stand that is done properly. Notice this individual does not use her hands to stand and she has her feet a little past shoulder width apart. Next, I'll be sharing some exercise guidelines, but I don't want these guidelines to be intimidating. I would recommend starting exactly where you are. And even if that means exercising once a week, that is still better than no exercise. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends older adults with sarcopenia perform strength training exercises for all major muscle groups at least two days per week. 
it's important to start with lighter weights and gradually increase the weight lifted over time. Number two, aerobic exercise, such as walking, cycling, or swimming are also important for overall health and to improve cardiovascular fitness. It is recommended to do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week. This can look like doing about 30 minutes of walking at least five days a week. Number three, balance and flexibility exercises. These exercises are also important as they can prevent falls and help maintain mobility. Balance exercises may include standing on one leg or practicing yoga or tai chi, while stretching exercises can improve flexibility and range of motion. Ideally, doing a combination of all three, strength training, aerobic exercise, and balance and flexibility exercises, would be the best way to prevent sarcopenia. However, some studies do show that strength and resistance training may be the most effective in preventing this. If you're interested in starting a personalized exercise program for yourself, I recommend discussing this with your doctor to see what is safest for you. Another important factor is your diet. A diet rich in protein, especially high quality protein sources, is essential for building and maintaining muscle mass. In addition to this, it's recommended to drink at least six to eight glasses of fluid a day. Sleep is another very important aspect of preventing sarcopenia. Getting enough restful sleep is important for muscle recovery and growth. And the recommendation is to get seven to eight hours of sleep per night. The good news here is that exercise is proven to improve your sleep. It turns out the old adage of move it or lose it is extremely true. Avoiding sedentary behavior has been shown to prevent sarcopenia. This means that prolonged sitting and inactivity can contribute to muscle loss. So try to break up long periods of sitting with regular movement and activity throughout the day. This takes us back to our quadricep comparison between a 74-year-old sedentary male and the 70-year-old triathlete. This is a great example to illustrate that our physical activity levels directly impacts our muscle mass. It's important to note that physical activity is more important than reducing sedentary behavior, meaning it's more important to exercise than to avoid sitting down often or watching television. Avoiding smoking and excessive alcohol consumption. Both smoking and heavy alcohol consumption have been linked to muscle loss, so reducing or eliminating these habits may help in slowing down sarcopenia. Perhaps the most important part to our lecture today is how strength training impacts bone health. Sarcopenia is associated with reduced bone density and an increased risk of osteoporosis. This also means an increased fall risk leading to a life-changing fracture such as a hip fracture. The good news is that bone 
is some of the most amazing living and dynamic tissue in the human body. And when you exercise, your bone tissue actually modifies itself and adapts in response to that exercise. Exercise doesn't just cause bone to increase in density. This bone also changes its shape and internal architecture directly in line of the stress that your bones have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It can also decrease and improve pain from arthritis in the knees and hips and other joints. Think of how incredible that is. Just like someone building a building with support beams and scaffolding and orient their little beams to deal with the forces that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The exercises we've discussed today all help with your bone health and they can help prevent fractures. When it comes to exercise and bone health, none of them mean much without consistency. And it's incredible to think that we have control over how this process unfolds. Lastly, I want to spend a little bit of time discussing exercise and the brain. Sarcopenia is associated with worsened memory issues in the older adult. Take a look at these two brains. On the left is a healthy brain, and on the right we have a brain that belonged to someone with advanced Alzheimer's disease. Did you know? that exercise is known to improve cognitive functions. We know that exercise can improve attention, memory, and executive function. It can also increase the volume of the brain, particularly in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, which are important for memory and learning. It can enhance a process called neuroplasticity, which literally changes the shape of the brain by stimulating the stem cells. It reduces the risk of developing dementia, improves mood, and protects against depression and anxiety. We discussed earlier how it enhances sleep, which is important for overall brain health and cognitive function and it can also reduce inflammation of the brain. In conclusion, I hope that today's lecture can serve as an important reminder that it's never too late to start exercising and improving. It is 100% possible to improve your mind-body connection no matter your age. Incorporating healthy habits in our routine can seem like a daunting task at times. But even starting with one small change can shift momentum in the right direction. With that said, I want to use the remainder of our time today to answer your questions, hear your comments and concerns, as well as welcome each of you to share your story and tell me a little bit about yourselves.